All right, gonna play some Bloody Palace while I do this. Hello. I'm gonna see if I can if I can do this while playing Bloody Palace, um, but we'll see. It's gonna be a little weird because I'm reading the script off of my phone because I only have one monitor. Um, so I'm probably gonna get my ass kicked, is what I'm saying. Let's see, what do I even have for Virgil? Looks like I have most of the stuff unlocked. That's good enough now. Also, let me know if, like, the volume is okay and stuff. Um, if it's not, like, too loud or anything. I'll play a few rounds and then I'll start the actual lecture. Just, you know, to give people some time to show up. Any day now, DMC5. There we go. just like insanely fast Virgil is at killing things. He's fun to play. an hour straight and didn't realize that my mic was turned off. I don't want that to happen again. So like, let me know if I'm good. Oh, it paused. Ow. Okay, thank God. I, I was, if I started talking and it, it, it was no. When Mike was turned off the whole time, I was going to turn off. Let me just pull this guy and hold it. Alright, so again, I apologize if this is a little weird because I'm reading the script off of my phone. Um, 
And also originally it was meant to be a video. Uh, I didn't quite write it with streaming in mind, so I'm going to try and do So, okay. Yeah. 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 characters have had a long lasting impact on characters might be mask characters. Rivals, minor characters can become wildly popular, you know, while reaching. But what if you think it's probably not going to be a boss who only appears in one game, has no speaking lines, and isn't even the final boss? But that's kind of exactly what happened with Nello Angelo, who is a corrupted version of Virgil who makes his first. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read and play at the same time. Um, he makes his debut in the first game. But Nello Angelo actually has a surprising legacy in the DMC. Um, but somehow at the same time, he's like kind of a fridge character. You know, he leaves you with this feeling of like, what just happened? Are we just not going to talk about this? So, what did happen? How has Nello Angelo impacted the series as a whole? And like, how and why do the writers around the clock. That's what we're going to talk about today. And just to be clear, um, this is going to have spoilers for the whole series. Um, I also, I had wanted to set up some sort of thing where I could, like, make the source for all my claims pop up on the screen. Um, but I ended up not really having time to do that, not being able to figure it out correctly. So, you'll just have to take me at my word, you know, I'll say where I got something. But, um, I will also put them in the description and upload that. Uh, so before we go any further... Oh, and I, I also want to say, if you guys have, like, any questions or comments or anything about anything I'm talking about, you know, feel free. You can just put uh, in the chat. Um, so I'm gonna explain who Nello Angelo is for people who might not know or just kind of a quick refreshment. So, he is Virgil, as we see here, our favorite bastard, Don Pistol. Um, he's not his usual self. He's a corrupted owl, fucker. Anyway, um, is Yeah, so he is a corrupted version of Virgil. He got shot by Moon Emperor. Oh, hang on, hang on. Doing this off of my phone and trying to play at the same time really, really kind of not my greatest idea. Um, okay. okay. So, uh, Emperor. Yeah, so he gets got by Moonus, who's the demon Emperor, and his family is like arch enemy. Um, and he appears as a boss in DS1, where he fights Dante three times, accompanied by some of the most banging music in the whole series. Which you can hear now because I've said it as uh, Virgil's theme instead of. No, we all love Bury the Light, but today we're gonna listen to Ultraviolet, and you're just gonna have to accept that. Um, so he finally gets defeated for good, and then he drops his half of the twins' heirloom amulet, and then Stevie dies. And so that's basically. Oh, am I? Hang on. Um, let me turn my mic up. Okay. I turned my mic up a bit, so hopefully that'll help. Also, it looks like my model's lagging a bit. I'm sorry about that. I don't know if there's really anything I can do there. Um, do, do I need to, uh, go over anything again? Did, did you miss anything that I said? This is my first time doing one of these, like, uh, Sort of video essay and so I apologize for what a mess it is. This is gonna be a learning experience and hopefully I'll do better next time. Okay, do you, do you want me to start from the beginning? Because I can do that if you like. I'm not too far. Alright, 
All right, I'll go back to the beginning. Okay. So, when you think of characters who have had a long-lasting impact on a series, what types of characters come to mind? There, I yelled it. You might think of me an antagonist, or love interest, or mascot characters, or you might think of secret protagonists, rivals, minor characters to get wildly popular for some reason, like, you know, like Waluigi. Um, but whoever you think of is probably not going to be a boss who appears in only one game, has no speaking lines, and isn't- Aw, oh, god damn it! I am so sorry. I don't know what my mic is doing. Um, it might also be my internet. Um, hang on. Okay. Yeah, alright, I'm gonna lower the game a little bit, turn my mic up again. Uh Okay. So we're gonna try this again. Hopefully it'll ho hopefully you'll hear it this time. Alright. Run the top. When you think of characters who have had a long lasting impact on a series, what types of characters come to mind? You might think of main antagonists, and love interests, or mascot characters like Pikachu, you might think of sequel protagonists, rivals, um, minor characters who become weirdly popular, like Waluigi. Um, but whoever you think of, it's probably not going to be a boss who only appears in one game, has no speaking lines, and isn't even the final boss. But that's kind of exactly what happened with DMC. Are you guys still able to hear me? Is this working now? Alright, on we go then. Alright. So I'm talking about Nello Angelo, who... Well, here's a little cousin of his, huh? So Nello Angelo is a corrupted version of Virgil who makes his debut in the first DMC game. And it might not seem like it at first glance, but Nello Angelo has a surprisingly strong legacy within the DMC franchise. But somehow... Some, bleh, somehow, at the same time, he manages to be kind of like a, a fridge character, you know? He leaves you with this feeling of like, are we just not going to talk about what just happened? So, what exactly did happen? How has Nello Angelo impacted the series as a whole, and why do the writers keep, like, brutally skirting around the topic? That's what we're going to talk about today. Once I manage to kill this guy so I can scroll down without dying. Come on. Come on, bitch. Oh my god. He just doesn't want to die. There we go. Okay. No, no, he's still alive. Oh my god. Come on. Why is he still alive? What the fuck? I'm gonna punch him. I don't understand why this guy won't die. All right, Jesus Christ. All right. So, continuing where we left off. Again, this will contain spoilers for the whole of DMC. Um, also, I was not able to set it up so that I wanted to do a thing where, like, the sources would show up on the screen. Um, you know, for, like, oh, this, this thing comes from DMC 1, this comes from the drama cities, whatever. But I wasn't able to set that up, so you're just gonna have to, like, take me at my word. I'm gonna, like, say where it came from, but I'm not gonna be able to put it on screen. But I will put it in the description, um, when I put the VOD on YouTube. So, uh, for people who aren't familiar with Nello Angelo or need a quick refresher, um, he is Virgil, our favorite bastard here. Um, he was... Dante's twin brother and the series kind of recurring like a uh, yes he's kind of an anti-hero antagonist I don't know Virgil's got a lot going on um so Nello Angelo is not Virgil as his usual self but a corrupted version of Virgil after he gets got by Mundus who is the demon emperor and the Esparta's family arch enemy he appears as a boss in DMC1 where he fights Dante three times 
accompanied by, as we can hear here, some of the most banging music in the whole series. Like, apologies to Bury the Light, but tonight we are going to listen to Ultraviolet. And that's that. Um, so he fights Dante three times, and then when he's finally defeated for good, he drops his half of the twins' heirloom amulet, and then seemingly just dies. And that's basically Nello Angelo. His name comes from an Italian to Japanese to English mistranslation of Nero Angelo, meaning Black Angel. Although, if I remember correctly, in the Japanese version of the DMC1 manual, it's actually spelled Nero Angelo, so I'm not quite sure where the L came in. Um, but regardless, it's stuck. So, the story of Nello Angelo begins at the end of DMC3. <laughs> Nello Angelo, yes. The story of Nello Angelo begins at the end of DMC3, which is the earliest game in the DMC timeline. Uh, at the end of the game, after losing to Dante, Virgil falls off a cliff into hell. Dante tries to stop him from falling, but Virgil doesn't let him, and, you know, there it goes. As far as Dante knows, that's where Virgil's story ends, but if you can defeat, um, at least a hundred demons during the end credits, you get to see what happens to Virgil after he falls off that cliff. There, he encounters a trio of glowing orbs, which he refers to as the Prince of Darkness, and decides he's going to fight it, um, despite his injuries, and says that if Sparta could do it, he should be able to as well. Again, despite being horribly injured. The game leaves it open-ended, but anyone who's familiar with DMC1 knows that Virgil obviously does not succeed. And then you unlock a fun new costume for Dante, because fuck Virgil, am I right? I hate these guys, by the way. It's a little... No, no, no! Oh! oh. Okay. Um, alright. So a nine-year time skip happens before the next time we see Virgil, but fortunately, the novels and the visions of B manga fill in some of the blanks. So, <laughs> he really is! He's got, he's got dumb bitch disease. Like, why did he think that fighting... Uh, Mundus was a good idea in his condition. It was- it was not. It was a bad idea. But anyway, so speaking of those injuries, unsurprisingly, these lead to his defeat. Although, the novel Before the Nightmare uh, notes that if he'd been in better shape, Virgil probably could have won because Mundus was still in a weakened state at the time. We see in Visions of V that Virgil stubbornly refused to give in even after his defeat, uh, he just talks some shit about him, and then he does some, like, freaky demon goop magic shit, and shoves him into some armor created by Machiavelli. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Machiavelli, which I'm gonna assume is most of you, because he's, he's really kind of a niche character, um, he's, like, he doesn't actually appear in anything. He gets mentioned several times outside the games, as well as in, um, I think Nico's file on Artemis in DMC5? Um, I'll have to go back and double check that one. Uh, but anyway, he gets mentioned in also Before the Nightmare and the first drama CD. He's a demon gunsmith whose works are hardly sought after by gun-wielding demons like Trish, um, Dante, I guess Lucia, did she have a gun? I really can't think of any other demons who use guns that we've seen. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But anyway, um, evidently he also makes magic armor. Um, and according to Before the Nightmare, Machiavelli had been employed by Mundus for at least a year prior to DMC3 um, to create something called the Black Knights, which were Armin D Ugh. Ugh. Huh. I can talk. I need to slow down. Oh god, it's boss fight time, isn't it? So the Black Knights were... Oh yeah, that's right, Sparta does, yeah. So the Black Knights, um, armored demon soldiers who fear nothing, um, they were designed to kill Dante and Virgil, but ultimately failed to, you know, defeat a pair of teenagers, because they're losers, I guess. Um, so back to Virgil. 
Uh, after he was defeated by Mundus, Mundus was like, Hey, wait, this kid's fucking strong. Why don't I just use him to create a better version of Black Knight? And so he did. And he called his creation Nello Angelo. The experiment was successful in making an extremely strong soldier, but unfortunately for Mundus, he felt that Virgil was still too unruly and difficult to control. Um, and again, this all comes from Before the Nightmare. Um, so he... I forgot how to read all of a sudden. Okay, he gave Virgil his amulet, which he'd previously taken away. Um, and Virgil viewed the amulet as some sort of symbol of power. So this managed to pacify his power cravings, and he became the fully obedient Nello Angelo. So now we come to DMC1. Um, while I'm trying not to die to, uh, Goliath here. I'm just gonna take a quick break from the lecture so I can see if I can beat this bastard. And then we'll talk about DMC1. Ah, oh, shit. I do wonder, though, like, they say that his his weapons were... Uh, Machiavelli, I mean. They say that his weapons were highly sought after by gun-wielding demons, but we really just don't see a lot of those who didn't already have some connection to the human world. You know, Dante, Trish, Sparta. So, I'd, I'd be interested to see more of those in the future. Well, what's he doing? Oh. I'm almost there, almost there. As soon as I beat him, we're gonna talk about DMC1. Well. Ah, shit. No, 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 fuck. Jesus. Okay. Alright, hopefully I can get him now. Oh yeah, yeah. Jesus. Virgil go room. What? Come on, come on, come on, come on. What? I almost got- there we go! Okay! Yeah, fuck you too, buddy. Alright. So now we can talk about DMC1. <laughs> Initially, back in 2001, the player in DMC1 isn't aware of Virgil's existence. It's mentioned briefly at the beginning that Dante once had a brother who died 20 years ago. Um, Dante's inventory also contains his amulet, which is a seemingly useless item that just has flavor text saying it's a memento from his mother and engraved with the words Virgil and Dante. But other than that, there's no explanation of who Virgil is, or anything about Dante's brother, other than that he apparently died at 8 years old. But despite this, Virgil's presence is really heavily foreshadowed in the game, and, and I think this is honestly pretty brilliant the way I did it. Um, the, the way they did it, excuse me. Even though it's kind of obtuse. Um, throughout Malay Island, the player encounters things that come in pairs of red and blue, like doors, um, those two doors on the Colosseum with the shields on them that you gotta, you know, do the thing. Um, there's those portals. Now, red, of course, we know is associated with sexy protagonist Dante and his cool vampire hunter jacket, but there initially isn't really anyone who's represented by the color blue. And if you're thinking, that's not obtuse at all. I mean, maybe it's meaningful in hindsight, but who's gonna look at a spooky castle having symmetrical decorations and, like, a color scheme and think, Ah! The protagonist's dead brother is going to make an appearance. Um, first of all, the red oni, blue oni trope. Uh, second of all, it gets better. When Nello Angelo finally makes his first appearance, he doesn't just stand around, like, waiting for Dante. He doesn't bust into the room all blah, 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 Sparta like most of the other bosses. No, he takes the form of Dante's reflection, 
steps out of the mirror and then stares at Dante for like a minute or two before revealing his true form. And all of this happens in a bedroom with an event trigger that's activated by stabbing a sword through a bust of a woman. Which I, I honestly didn't think of much of it before I started doing my research here. But it could kind of be a reference to Eva's death since as far as I know, um, at that point in the series development, uh, the exact circumstances of her death were not fully determined yet. Um, so Nello Angelo invites Dante to fight out in the courtyard, and then there's a pretty fun boss fight. Um, Dante actually almost loses. Oh no, I scrolled too far, help. I keep doing this. Okay, okay, I'm back. Alright. So Dante almost loses, only for Nello Angelo to abruptly stop the moment he sees Dante's amulet. He throws Dante away and starts clutching his head and lightning pulses across his armor. And, um, 321 graphic. Uh, three, not 321. 3142. I'm never gonna get that right. <laughs> 3142 graphic art, uh, actually confirms that this is him regaining his repressed memories of his former identity. And this is apparently so distressing to him that he, like, blasts off Team Rocket style? Like, like Virgil's always been able to, you know, teleport and stuff. But this is completely di He's just fucking, like, see you space cowboy. He is gone. Alright. I don't know, like, since when he Oops. Hi, B. I don't know since when he can do that, but... I guess that's a thing. Oh god, why is it lagging so bad? Alright, so Nello Angelo returns for a rematch at the Coliseum, um, and there's not really a lot to talk about plot-wise here, but I do want to take a minute to discuss Nello Angelo as an enemy, because he's pretty interesting. He's kind of a standout in that, at least at this point in the game, he's the only boss who can be seen as in any way analogous to Dante. You know, all the other bosses thus far have been non-humanoid, they haven't used weapons, they've just used either magic or their bodies, you know, like, um... Oh god, what's his name? Phantom, you know. Um, so, Nello Angelo is already pretty notable in that he's a humanoid demon who wields a sword, but that's not the end of the similarities. His fighting style is distinctly similar to Dante's, which the in-game file on him actually mentions, saying that he's well versed in the same art as com mm, I can talk. Well versed in the same art of combat as Dante's. These guys are really annoying me. Weak. Oh, I summoned B again. Let's see if it lags horribly again. Okay, not as bad this time, but still pretty bad. Weird. Bye V. Anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, so Nello Angelo even goes so far as to taunt Dante during battle, in a pretty similar way to Dante's own taunts. And like, you know, I could be reading too far into it, but I feel like this is kind of, like, brilliant on a, like, a mental level. Because taunting isn't something that other enemies really do. Um, they don't even really react to it. In both DMC1 and just, like, video games in general, taunting is usually thought of as kind of a gimmick mechanic. Like, it'll get the style gauge up a little bit, but if you do it at the wrong moment, you're just gonna get your ass kicked. So, the payoff is so minimal that it's basically more for giving yourself a laugh than for anything. And again, other enemies don't really react to it, so it's like they're not even aware that you're doing it. Um... So it's pretty jarring to see Nello Angelo suddenly do what up until now, like, only Dante has even been aware of at all. It seems to elevate him to a higher level of importance and awareness by making him feel more like the player themselves, um, giving, them a giving him access to this player that only power- excuse me, I really need to slow down. So it gives him access to this power that only the player has until now. Like, damn, you know? I just think that's really cool the way they did that. Um, and I think it adds a lot to him. Speaking of taunts, let's see. 
There we go. So the third fight is where things take a turn for the tragic. Next time we see Nello Angelo. Ow! Oh! I keep summoning B by accident. You know why? You know why? It's because I'm used to Guilty Gear. I'm used to playing fucking Chip and doing that, like, um, you know, kind of little twirl you gotta do to, to do, like, Alpha Blade and shit. I keep instinctively doing that, but when you, when you spin the joystick, um, and I think you press a certain button, it just summons V. So I keep accidentally doing that. Anyway. So, the third fight. Uh, well, when the next time we see Nello Angelo, he's initially facing away from Dante and staring out a window at a thunderstorm, which, you know, ooh, inner turmoil symbolism, right? Um, and when he turns around, Dante makes the following comment. He says, A man with guts and honor. I like that. But it's a shame you serve Mundus. Um, which is something that also the manual comments on as well. Um, both the Japanese and the English editions of the manual note that it's unusual for someone from the underworld to fight fairly and honorably, and they question why Virgil, I mean, uh, Nello Angelo works for the forces of evil despite, you know, having that kind of a personality. And this guy is going to be a pain in the ass. It's kind of ironic that I'm struggling with fighting the Angelos in, uh, during this lecture, huh? They've got, like, I don't know, they're, they're weirdly high stamina, I think. Come on, get that. Ow! What? God damn it. There we go. Okay, so, um, as a little side note, the manual, for some reason, really hypes up Phantom. It's like, he might be the strongest general in the underworld. Like, literally, who thinks that? Um, and also, both versions of the manual are pretty similar. Um, pretty much identical in text, but the English edition specifically says that Dante is American, while the Japanese one doesn't. So, I think that says a lot about what gaming was like in 2001, you know, localization and stuff. So anyway, uh, once Nello Angelo turns around, he starts doing this, like, Super Saiyan power-up thing, um, which briefly blinds the player, and then reveals his true face underneath the helmet, which is pale and gaunt and covered in purplish veins, glowing red eyes. Uh, he barely resembles Dante at all, honestly. But he still does have Virgil's distinct hairstyle. Although, again, obviously this would not have meant anything to someone playing the game before DMC3 came out. Uh, but in hindsight, um, you know, with official confirmation that the amulet caused Virgil to begin regaining his memories, honestly, that scene feels kind of, like, sad, you know? It's kind of like a, like a cry for help. Like, he's trying to show Dante who he really is. But Dante just doesn't recognize him. Which um, leads me to another point that I'd like to bring up. Um, so Project Cross Zone 2, which is a Capcom crossover game. Um, honestly, I don't really understand anything about like what's going on in that game. Like, Ulala from Space Channel 5 is there, and Virgil talks about like a room made of meat with a giant baby in it. Like, I, I don't know, I haven't played the game. I've just literally just watched the Nello Angelo cutscenes on YouTube. Um, but what stands out to me from those is that both Dante and time-traveling DMC3 Virgil uh, can sense that Nello Angelo seems to be a relative of Sparta. And they keep trying to get him to reveal his identity, which, of course, he doesn't. Um, but eventually Virgil seems to pick up that he might be a version of himself. And he doesn't seem to want to tell Dante this, which is pretty depressing. Um, and while the events of Project Cross Zone 2 are not uh, canon to DMC, um, it might seem irrelevant, but it does kind of touch on something that I think is pretty important that gets overlooked sometimes. 
Um, and that's that demons, uh, higher demons at least, can sense and identify individual demons. Uh, which is something that's been established since DMC1. Which is why every other boss that meets Dante is all, you know, Oh, I'm gonna kill you, you, you uh, Sparta. Um, and the scene with Beowulf in DMC3 also confirms that Dante and Virgil have the exact same demonic aura. Um, because Beowulf initially mistakes Virgil for Dante. Um, saying something about, oh, I remember your rancid scent or some shit like that. Poor Dante. This is a lot of guys. Alright, let me, let me beat up some of these dudes. I wish I had the motorcycle. It's really good for taking on big crowds. Come on. Ow. This is so many guys. Yeah, virtual with, the, with a little scooter. That would be so good. Or what about Virgil with a stupid sports car like Edgeworth? Come on. Come on. I need some healing. That's what I need. Ah, shit. Yeah. If I lose to this guy, I'll cry. Oh my god, there's two of them? I didn't even notice. Come on, come on. Where's the other one? Oh god. Alright, so that guy's dead. Whoop. Okay, whew. Oh my god. Alright. Um, so going back to that thing I was talking about with demons being able to sense other demons. Um, what I'm getting at is that apparently whatever Mundus did to Virgil has, like, warped him so completely, like, down to his soul, that Dante doesn't recognize him even though he's his twin brother. Like... That's pretty fucked up right there. Let's just, like, let's just take a minute to think about that, because what the fuck? <coughs> anyway, throughout the course of the third fight, we see Nello Angelo use Virgil's famous summon swords move for the first time. Um, which, unfortunately for him, isn't enough to protect him from a skilled player, or, you know, one who just fucking throws acid on him repeatedly. I I cannot bring myself to use holy water on Nello Angelo. It just feels too fucking mean. But I know a lot of people get through the fight that way. Um, but anyway, you know, eventually he's defeated and again he begins clutching his head and it seems like he's gonna do that Team Rocket thing again. Um, but instead he just uh, seemingly explodes and then he drops uh, a red pendant, which is identical to Dante's, and we hear a flashback of Eva giving Dante and Virgil the amulets for their birthday. And it's that moment that Dante realizes that he has just killed his own brother. Again. Until DMC5 reveals that Virgil actually somehow survived, which has yet to be explained. Thank you, Capcom. So, that concludes the overview of Nello Angelo's in-game appearance. Um, so with that depressing recap out of the way, we're going to talk about his legacy after I beat up these guys. Sin scissors are really annoying. Like, is that just me? Do I just, like, have a problem with them or does anyone else find them fucking annoying? Thank you, Dante. Oh. Bye, V. Thanks for hanging out, bro. Alright. Ah, I gotta take down this guy first, because I don't like the exploding eyeballs. Music does slap, though. See? I told you Nello Angelo's theme was good. Ah! 
Ow! I'm not doing good. I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't want to lose to a bunch of sin scissors. I'll be embarrassed. It'll be cringe. And then I'll lose subscriber. Nope. No, 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 no. Okay. Come on! Just die already! Oh my god, okay. Finally. So. Uh, in order to understand the lasting legacy of Nello Angelo on the DMC franchise, you have to first understand the history of DMC's development to a certain extent. Um... So, Nello Angelo is still very relevant to the ongoing lore of the series, even, like, you know, at this point in time, you know, after DMC5 and all that. So, DMC3 remains the game that takes place earliest in the DMC timeline, but the first uh, DMC media to be released was, of course, the original Devil May Cry. In 3142 Graphic Arts, aha, I said it right this time. Uh, concept artist Makoto Tsuchibayashi notes that the series creator Hideki Kamiya, um, he always had some sort of semblance of plans for Dante and Virgil even in the earliest phases of DMC's development, when the game was still intended to be Resident Evil 4. Um, he doesn't specify what exactly those plans were, but we do see some early concept art of Virgil, um, which does confirm the existence of Virgil as a person outside of Nello Angelo. Um, and that he did have some role in the story's background. Um, and the, co the concept art for Virgil does... Why do these guys keep shooting fire at me? It, it does have um, some elements of the Virgil that we all know and love. Like, he has a katana and um, a suit. Uh, and Tsuchibayashi states that these were intended to contrast with Dante. And I'm gonna get my ass kicked by some fucking pyrobats. I did not like that. Oh. Come on, come on. Ah! Ah! No, no, no! 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 Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, God. Oh, no. You know what, though? Considering I was reading instead of looking at the screen most of this time, I'd say stage 34 is pretty good. Oh my god, the rip emoji has a little, like, Christmas wreath on it. That's cute. It's not Christmas time, though. Uh, anyway. So, the next piece of media to come after DMC1 is actually the novel, which is just, just titled Devil May Cry, and it's intended to be a prequel to the game. Um, so, I won't get into that one too much, because it's a little weird. Um, there's a lot that doesn't really make sense about it. Um, for a long time it was thought to be non-canon or retconned, but then DMC5 and For the Nightmare seeming like unretconned it by referencing a lot of the events of the novel. Um, and the main reason I'm go bringing this up is because I know a lot of people might remember Gilver and be like, what about Gilver? Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, Gilver is like this dude whose face is all covered in bandages, you know, like that one bitch from Rurouni Kenshin. Um, and he totally isn't Virgil. No idea who Virgil is. Nope, never heard of him. He's totally different guy. No reason he's got a katana. Just completely different guy. Anyway, um, so Gilver kills a bunch of people that Dante cares about. Uh, Dante kills Gilver, and surprise, surprise, he takes the bandages off and gasps. Gilver looked exactly like his brother. Oh no, what a tragedy. Haven't seen that one before, right? So the weird thing about Gilver is that it's still kind of unclear, like, where he fits in, or if he's even still canon. Um, because you know he can't actually have been Virgil at this point in the series lore. Um, because we know that Virgil was, like, you know, off doing his plotting and scheming and whatever with the, um, 
uh, fucking Tim and you grew. Um, so, a lot of people claim that as of DMC5, uh, Gilver was actually supposed to be a failed prototype, Angelo, who was created based on studying how Dante and Virgil fight. Um, I can't find any actual confirmation of this anywhere. Um, we do know that Mundus was sending Angelos to kill Dante and Virgil, and that he did use his observations on the family's fighting style to make them, uh, but Gilver himself doesn't actually get mentioned in Before the Nightmare, so he's still just kind of a big mystery. So, if you're wondering, you know, again, what about Gilver? Uh, I don't know. Nobody knows. But anyway... The next thing to be developed is uh, another game that we're not going to talk about because it's not important. And then there's the second novel, um, which interestingly enough features, oh hello me, um, a post-DMC1 Dante who gets like sent to an alternate reality um, where he'd been either captured or killed by Mundus as a kid. Um, and Virgil led an organized rebellion against Mundus before eventually dying and becoming a martyr. The alternate Virgil apparently went by the name Nello Angelo, uh, and Virgil's real name is never mentioned in the novel. He's only referred to as Nello Angelo or Dante's brother. And Dante does remember fighting Nello Angelo at Melee Island, but for some reason he doesn't seem to have much of an emotional response to, you know, having murdered his brother. But we'll talk more about that a little later on. So finally we come to DMC3, Dante's Awakening, which was released in February of 2005. And this is the game that changed DMC's lore forever. It was the first game to introduce Dante's brother Virgil, as he'd been before he became Hello Angelo. In the unfinished prequel manga, which I briefly touched on, um, set a year before the game, it also confirms uh, something that the novel previously implied, which is that Dante uh, witnessed uh, his mother's death at a young age when the demons attacked their house, and that he also believed Virgil to have died in the attack. Um, DMC3 also explains, as mentioned, the origins of Nello Angelo by showing how Virgil's, you know, chronic stupid bitch disease led to him getting captured by Mundus. Um, so DMC3's Virgil was just like an instant fan favorite. Um, DMC3 was by far and large Virgil's biggest appearance up until DMC5, and it still contains the most scenes of Virgil as himself and not, you know, Nello Angelo or V or whatever. Um, and Virgil has consistently remained a very popular and memorable, memorable character on par with Dante himself. So of course this puts Nello Angelo in a different perspective, given that so little was known about Virgil up until DMC3. Um, and I myself didn't get into DMC until around the release of DMC5, uh, so I actually posted on Reddit, um, I asked people who had, um, you know, been there to experience it at that time, um, about that kind of shift in perspective, um, and what they think of Nello Angelo. So, the general consensus from people who responded to the post was that either they didn't really think of much of Nello Angelo at first, because um, they were too young to think too deeply about it, or they suspected a connection to Dante, but they weren't sure exactly what that connection was. Um, one commenter called, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Ginaz, uh, said, uh, I had no idea until I heard Eva's voice after the fight. I just thought maybe they knew each other somehow. Um, not Yoshihide says, I at first thought it was Dante's father Sparta brainwashed, but a familial relationship was immediately on my mind. His mom's necklace triggered PTSD on him. Um, I'm, I'm quoting, I'm not, you know, don't come at me for the phrasing. Um, but in general, people seem to react positively to the plot twist about Nello Angelo's identity, um, saying that it added a lot of depth to the story and that it was a surprising twist. Um, not a lot of the people I spoke to said that they had theories regarding uh, how Virgil became Nello Angelo. Um, a few people mentioned assuming that Mundus had captured Virgil as a child, or that he had actually killed him and resurrected him, which is interesting. Um, kind of close. Um, 
one thing I do find interesting is that um, among the people who responded to my post, there did seem to be kind of a unanimous praise for Virgil's character in DMC3 and the dynamic with him. But mm, mm, mm. <sighs> the dynamic between him and Dante. Uh, and in regards to Nello Angelo, um, most agreed that knowing Virgil's backstory added a lot more emotional weight to those fights. So it's 2005, cat's out of the bag. Whatever questions fans may have had about Nello Angelo, you know, who he was and how he became Luke's minion, they're now pretty much answered. So you'd think Nello Angelo's storyline has come to the close, so that's the last we're going to hear about him, right? Wrong. In 2008, we get Devil May Cry 4, which is a slight departure from the series' usual story, as those of you who've played it know. Um, instead of dealing with the conflict between Dante, Virgil, um, Sparta, and Mundus, uh, it features a new location, new characters, and Dante and the others are kind of more of a supporting role. Um, and the villains in this one are the Order of the Sword, who are like a cult dedicated to Sparta, and uh, Virgil and Mundus really aren't brought up much. Um, but Nello Angelo still manages to sneak into the story anyway. Um, throughout the game, the player encounters various armored enemies with the suffix Angelo, including Bianco Angelos and Alto Angelos. Uh, the in-game file on these enemies describes them as artificially created demons, powered with either uh, human or demon souls. It also mentions that they were made from a fragment of a demon called the Dark Angel, which I'm, I'm hoping just means a piece of his armor. Um, but given that the Order of the Sword is like a weird version of Catholicism, I wouldn't be surprised if they've got like Virgil's finger in a jar somewhere or some shit like that. Um, and I'm allowed to make jokes about Catholicism because I'm Hispanic, so, you know, don't come for me. Um, but anyway, so the concept of Pseudo Angelos as recurring enemies continues in DMC5, as we've seen from me, you know, struggling to beat them today. Um, and in this one, player encounters the Prudo Angelo, uh, Prudo? Proto and Scudo. I can, I can find them into one. Uh, the Proto Angelo and the Scudo Angelo. Former, um, looks almost identical to Nello Angelo. And the wiki says that those guys are basically, um, hang on, did my internet just die? Nope, nope, I'm good. Okay. My phone disconnected for some reason, but I think I'm okay. Uh, here we go. So, yeah, the wiki says that the Proto and Scudo Angelos are basically leftover Black Knights who got repurposed by Urizen. Um, although, again, I can't find any source on this one. Um, but it does seem to make sense because the only real alternative is that either Urizen made them from random humans, um, which I kind of doubt because he needed, like, a shitload of human blood for, you know, his magic truffula tree or whatever. Um, so I don't think he would have, uh, wasted human captives on making more minions when he already had a bunch. Um, so the hypothesis that they're leftover, uh, Angelos from Mundus's army seems pretty plausible, I think. Um, I just don't have any official confirmation on that. Um, but that being said, there are a few exceptions. Um, one of the bosses, one of my favorite bosses, is the Cavalier Angelo, who is one of the best designs in the whole game, okay? Like, she's got a big purple fuck-off horse, or, and a sword, and, or, sorry, a big purple fuck-off sword, and a horse, and wings, and, like, not just any horse, either. It's a Garion, which, um, for those of you who have played DMC3, is, uh, the glowing blue Zawarudo horse. Um, and, like, that's just, I don't know, it just slaps, like, Everything about uh, Cavalier Angelo just fucks, okay? Um, but the main thing about her is that uh, n n Cavalier Angelo isn't just another one of Moose's prototypes. It's actually made using Trish as the core um, after she gets defeated by Urizen. Um, and he also does something similar with Lady, uh, creating the demon Artemis. 
And so the fact that Virgil's, like, demon Sona is running around, um, you know, Angeloing people after what Mundus did to him? I, I, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot to unpack there. So, speaking of unpacking, the next subject is uh, the most recent piece of the DMC story, which is Visions of V. And here is one of the Angelos themselves. Um, so Visions of V is an ongoing manga um, that follows V from his birth, birth, you know, um, up through the events of DMC5. Uh, and it goes a lot deeper into post-DMC3 Virgil's, like, mental state than the games ever did. It shows not only the specifics of Nello Angelo's creation, um, but it also reveals that Virgil's time as Nello Angelo impacted him so deeply that it was part of what drove him to separate uh, his human half from his demon half. Um, except that, as it turns out, he didn't just separate his human half from his demon half. Um, some of you may have noticed that these familiars, like, are vaguely kind of based on um, the bosses from DMC1. They share, you know, names, appearances, abilities, um, to some extent. Um, and turns out, that's not just, like, a fun callback to the first game. They're actually manifestations of Virgil's trauma from his time um, working for Mundus, which is why they take the form of his, you know, co-workers, I guess you could call them. Um, so not all these trauma demons were particularly agreeable, but we did manage to find a contact with three of them. Find a con find a contact form a contract. Jesus, I keep talking too fast. I'm sorry. Uh, he formed contracts with three of them um, in a mutual bid to try to survive. Um, and Visions of V also shows that the trauma from Nello Angelo uh, weighs pretty heavily on V's mind. Um, when he first encounters the Cavalier Angelo, he seems to, like, have a, an actual panic attack. Um, he momentarily sees Nello Angelo and he jumps back, and there's this kind of, like, raw fear on his face. It's, it's kind of chilling because I don't think that sort of expression has ever been shown on or any other incarnation of Virgil, like, up until now. Um, and something similar happens also with the large group of proto-Angelos that he encounters with Nero. Um, he starts to freak out, and Griffin tries to tell V to calm down, um, says that what he's seeing is just a memory and that the Angelos are not him. Um, and then V just goes full-on murder mode and declares that he's going to kill all the Angelos, um, which he does. And then he confronts a vision of Nello Angelo himself. Um, and he tells it, I will no longer be caged by you. And then he kills the last of the Angelos. Which, like, good for him. You know? We love we love growth. Um, so, I, I know this is kind of long. Um, there is really a lot to unpack behind Nello Angelo. Um... And I think a lot of people don't realize that, which is why I decided that I wanted to talk about it, because it's just such an interesting subject that I really don't see a lot of people discussing um, in as much depth as they should. Um, but at this point, we, we're basically done. We made it through every appearance and mention of Nello Angelo in DMC. So now that we've learned you know, how he appears, how often the writers talk about him. Now we're going to talk about how they don't talk about him. Because here's the thing. Despite how consistently Nello Angelo gets brought up, it's always, like, really indirect, you know? He'll get alluded to, like, little hints of his existence, you know, in, like, the file or whatever. And he's never really outright discussed. Even in Nico's notes in Team C5, um, where she does mention him um, in relation to, I think, uh, I think, I think the um, Cardo and Scudo Angelos, um, he's only ever referred to as the Black Angel, and she doesn't seem to know who the Black Angel actually was. Um, and you know, it's been 20 years since the release of DMC1. 
Um, but Visions of V has honestly been the first thing to actually go into the emotional side of Nello Angelo, um, showing us, you know, how the whole thing affects Virgil. And, like, God bless Tomio Ogata for that. Because, like, no one else will talk about it. And that just kind of epitomizes the whole situation with Nello Angelo. Because the writers, you know, they put so much into this, like, dramatic story, setting up this unexpected betrayal, lost family, stuff like that. And they just kind of, like, ignore it all? You know, Nello Angelo's existence in the rest of the series has been reduced to just this, you know, really powerful dead demon knight who we can use as a template for cool new enemies. But when it comes to the emotional side of things, they just don't talk about it. They always seem to shy away from it. DMC5, you know, it shows Virgil's decline and the ultimate results of his trauma, but it doesn't actually talk about Nello Angelo. It just leaves that to the manga, which, you know, not a lot of people are going to see compared to the actual game. And we also really don't see a lot of Dante's end of things either. Like... You know, Dante accidentally killed his own brother after he thought that he'd failed to save Virgil from a tragic fate years earlier, so you'd think he'd be pretty shaken up by that, right? But there really isn't much discussion of that. In DMC1, he just kind of, like, moves on since, you know, he's still gotta kill Mundus. Um, and after that... Mm, like, fans have often, uh, kind of assumed that the reason why he's so depressed in the anime and in DMC2 is that, you know, because of what happened with Nello Angelo, since both of those take place kind of ambiguously sometime after DMC1, um, but there's no direct confirmation of this because Virgil is never mentioned in either DMC2 or the anime. Um, at least I think he wasn't mentioned in DMC2, and I don't care to go back through it to find out because fuck that game. Um, but so the more I've kind of dug into this story of Nello Angelo, the more I keep wondering what's going on. Like, it feels like the writers are afraid to directly discuss what happened to Virgil or how it affected the characters. Like, it's very hush-hush, like they don't want to talk about it. And like, why? It's not like Nello Angelo has been retconned or forgotten about since they keep bringing him up in, like, you know, game mechanics. But... Why does his actual story feel so taboo to talk about? And I wish I had an answer to that, but, you know, I've been thinking about it for a while. And honestly, I don't know. The best guess I can make is that maybe they've been saving, um, been saving it for when Virgil himself makes a more direct appearance. But, I mean, he's pretty solidly back in the game with DMC5, you know, here he is. But... They still don't talk about it much outside of Visions of V. And, like, there's so much to unpack. There's so much that just has not been answered. Like, you know, how long was he under Mundus's control? What happened to him during that time? How aware was he during DMC1? What was he feeling? How did he survive Dante apparently murdering him? And what did Dante feel afterwards? You know, did Trish know about Virgil? Um, did she, like, did they work together? Uh, how did Agnes get part of Nello Angelo? Why was Yurizen Angeloing people when the whole thing was so traumatic to Virgil? Like, there's just so many questions that I could ask about Nello Angelo, and my game is lagging real bad. Um, but I guess for now, those questions are going to remain unanswered. And I really do hope that future DMC media will explore Nello Angelo's character a bit more since it's, it's genuinely starting to feel kind of weird how deliberately they just avoid talking about it. Um, but until then, all these questions are going to keep me up at night. And now maybe they're going to keep you up too. Um, but that's basically the end of it. Um, I hope that this has been interesting. Um, I, I apologize for how awkward and weird this has been like like i said this is my first time um doing this sort of stream um i'm thinking next time i do something like this i'm probably gonna do it as a powerpoint instead of trying to read and play the game at the same time um but nonetheless i hope it's been interesting i hope you guys enjoyed it um 
I, I would appreciate feedback. Um, also, again, it, like if you've got any questions or anything, um, I'm going to stay on for a few more minutes, do a couple more rounds. So, like, yeah, just feel free to put whatever in the chat, you know. Um, but thank you for watching, and I hope you had fun. And I definitely want to do more of this media analysis kind of stuff in the future. So now we're just going to fight Goliath and probably die. Uh-oh. Come on. I know he's going to do it. Or maybe not. Yep, yep. Ah! 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 Fireball! Ah! Fuck! I died. Well, I mean, it's convenient timing, at least, I guess. Alright. Let's listen to uh, Ultraviolet for a little bit. Kind of finish up, see if, you know, anybody's got any more questions or anything. You know, just go ahead. Um, and then that'll be it for the night. Oh, I do want to check, um, let's look at the gallery and see, uh, Nico's notes on, because I think it's Artemis where she mentions Machiavelli. So I'm just going to take a look at that real quick. Thank you, I'm glad you liked it. Um, there we go, let's see. Yep, there she goes. You heard of Machiavelli, he's a legend, one of the Underworld's top gunsmiths. Yep. Yep. I knew he was mentioned. But anyway. Um, I guess that's going to be it for the night. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Um, and I'll see you on Friday. We're going to build the Millennium Puzzle. Wait, what, what? What's your question? Chocolate sundaes over strawberry, you know? I don't know. That's a good question. Because... I mean, Dante and Virgil both like chocolate, or at least did when they were eight years old, as confirmed by DMC1's weird flashback scene. Um, but uh, if my theory that Dante likes red food because it reminds him of blood is correct, then it is possible that Virgil would also like strawberry. Um, so I don't think that's a question that I can answer with any certainty. But... Maybe he'd like chocolate a little more. He does seem like a chocolate kind of guy. Oh, chocolate. Oh, yeah, yeah. Neapolitan ice cream. There we go. All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everybody. Good night.